the cross that is named here. The cross uh, can have multiple meanings. So, and the second uh, last slide will hopefully open it up for you so you know what a moral cross is or even what it is and what it isn't. But look at it for a moment as a crossroad. You are at a crossroad, you can either go value something as, as a good thing or a bad thing. Good communication or bad communication. So, linking back to Jesper, uh, if my 14-year-old son uh, asks me, Hey dad, should we drink a beer together? I can have a, a choice I can choose between that's a good thing or I can choose it's a bad thing. So I can attach the, uh, the different values. That's a very simple version. That's basically where we start. So the dissertation project, and this is the first time I uh, present the complete uh, title to, to anyone, uh, is Diabolical Communication. And it has the uh, subtitle Contributions to a Foundation of Sociologica uh, Crucis. What does it mean? Well, diabolical communication means it has something to do with the devil. What else would it be? And the contribution to the foundation of a sociologia crucis uh, harks back to the tradition that started about 100 years ago uh, to identify and, and redescribe uh, Reformation theology, especially Lutheran theology, as uh, linked to the cross, the theologia crucis. But there is no sociology of the cross. So it, it seems to me uh, when you read history, when you read uh, sociology of religion, when you read the sociology of uh, sociological analysis of, of uh, church pragmatics, of, of symbols, of forms, it is either a question of theology or history. But to create theory about uh, the, today we could say even the secular function of, of a cross, we need a, so, a sociology of the cross. And this is what, what this is the very first contribution to. So the timeline uh, for this project actually started here in, in Dubrovnik in 2013 with a, a paper on the system theory in the Trinitarian theology. I continued to look at the uh, theological precursors to Luminium system theory. And in 2014, I discovered this uh, great uh, quotation that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, my position is with the devil, says Luhmann in an interview 2006, uh, published 2006. My position is with the devil. He discerns uh, or distinguishes stronger and sees more. And that was kind of the, the entry uh, into what is the observational position of Luhmann himself? What, what are the reflections? So there are a couple of questions that I ask in that uh, particular uh, paper. And that is, one, what devil? There are not only one, there is not one, only one devil in the history of the use of the semantics of devils and the theological constructions of devils. So which one or which devils is Luhmann's devil? And of course, one could say uh, it's obvious, of course, it's Faust. It's Mephistoteles in, in the Faust one that he refers to. I went on and looked for uh, different concepts of devils and applications of devils in the uh, works of Luhmann. And actually, it, at least since the 90s, uh, the devil shows up everywhere. So if you go and look for yourself in, in, in your books and search for devil or Satan and Mephistoteles, you will have hits after hit after hit after hit in the publications, which is interesting. It's kind of a, a, a common theme uh, drawn throughout the late Luminian works, and I have not yet uh, seen anyone else discover that. Last time I presented uh, a paper here on the Book of God and the Books of Man, a, a question of double entry bookkeeping and system theory, which again was a, a question of accounting, uh, accounting of, of deeds. Um, what are the good deeds and bad deeds that I've done? Uh, it harks back to the very early, uh, actually pre-Babylonian um, developments in, in the uh, Genesis and uh, the, the five books of Moses and, and the, uh, the, the struggle for, for, for a Jewish man would be that he would have to, to write a personal book, a personal account of all his deeds and when he after death would meet uh, his God, 
then they would compare their books. And of course, uh, the, the Jewish God knew everything, every good deed and every bad deed that, that the Jewish man had uh, performed uh, throughout his life. So the question was not if the man was honest or dishonest, but if he was careful enough to uh, note and mark and write all his deeds. And the, the Jewish man, not the woman, not the, the kids, but the man, the, folk, uh, the, the patriarch of the family, would even get this book with him into the grave. So, ah, I need to speak louder, good. Um, so he took it uh, back to, uh, would take this book back to the grave. So we have heard some uh, applications of uh, the questions of moral communication as an, a trigger function, alarm function, uh, uh, discerning between what is good and what is evil. I'd like to uh, take a different path. It's, I think it's compatible with the uh, Lumanian perspective, but uh, wanted to go a bit further into the very early history of communications of society. And I quote, I told you, you can look for uh, the devil in Luhmann's work. And if you go to uh, the religion of society, Religion der Gesellschaft, published posthumously in 2000, page 98. And, and, and there he, he says, An sich könnte gerade die christliche Theologie wissen, dass die Moral, das heißt, die Unterscheidung von Gut und Böse vom Teufel ist. And I'll translate. The Christian theology could or even should uh, have known uh, that uh, the moral communication, that is, the distinction between good and evil, stems from the devil. And then he continues on, and uh, a bit further down, he says, Auch die Theologie ist mithin ein Opfer des Sündenfalls und sie kann allenfalls damit trösten, dass das Ganze ohnehin eine von Gott inszenierte Geschichte und die Schlange nur eine Vorgeschichte, die Abivalenz der Moral verdeckende Figur gewesen ist. So, point is, the, the, the story about the tree and, and, and the apple, it's, it was all just an inszenation, it was all predetermined and uh, the, it was, it was a, a, a history uh, uh, that that uh, hit the the basic moral distinction that was already there. So it, when when Adam and Eve ate uh, from the from the tree of knowledge, uh, it just emerged, but it was there all along. So I gave you that quote. If you look at the the Wissenschaft der Gesellschaft, uh, the, the science uh, of society, well. In page 178 and, and, and fourth, uh, the Lumanian, uh, uh, Luman argues, well, uh, throughout the, the medieval period, we had two types of observations. We had of, of God. Uh, the theologians would observe God, and these observations would, of course, be good observations, whereas the observations of God made by the devil would be evil. Uh, observations or bad observations. It's not only a question of intention, but Luhmann then uh, continues to describe that the theologians really had a, a serious struggle throughout the medieval period to, to argue why their observations of God are good and the observations of the devil are bad is, and not the other way around. Why shouldn't the theologians observe God and their observations being bad, equally to a, a diabolical observation. So they had this double uh, reference. They had to ref, uh, at one point look at, and uh, they observed God and they observed the devil. And even though they both observed um, God, uh, some of it was a, a good observation and some of it was an evil observation. We can also look somewhere else. Uh, one point I saw that uh, Luhmann did actually read this book and, and reference it. It's from the brother of Max Weber. Uh, he, uh, Alfred Weber uh, wrote the book Das Tragische und die Geschichte. It was published 1943. 
um, in the uh, in Germany. So it partly it was ridic ridiculed and, and forgotten. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, some historians that, that took this idea of the axial time uh, and uh, tried to make a philosopher of, of history and try to, to build a, a real a history of, of the, the actual time um, in itself. And we can use that book as he uh, discerns the, Europe, you know, the global history of the actual time, even though we might uh, not agree with the concept of actual time as, as uh, Jan Asman has uh, recently shown in his book from 2018. If we look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, that's one of the very, very early uh, texts that have survived throughout the times. It's, in short, it's a ruling king Gilgamesh of the city Eurus. Um, he is converted from an oppressive ruler to a good and just king through a godly intervention. There's a god that creates the Enkidu, a wild beast. Um, this wild beast meets a human woman. They have sex in, and this, uh, civilizes uh, <clears throat> Enkidu. They, uh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh become friends. They go out, they kill somebody else. There's some, some, some bad uh, celestial being and Enkidu dies. And the, the, um, the king Gilgamesh then becomes a good and, and an honest king. So the epic centers around the divine demand for a moral just rule. It's a good rule when it is a just rule. And it has been handed down and it was a very, very common story to be told for centuries in Mesopotamia. And, and the, actually the, the, the king of Gilgamesh, uh, uh, Bilgam, Bilga something, uh, he was a factual uh, king in, in the 20th century before Christ. The other one would be the prophecy of Nefertiti. It's not Nefertiti, the, beauty, uh, the most beautiful uh, uh, woman before Cleopatra in Egypt, but the prophecy of Nefertiti. Usually in the old kingdoms of, of uh, Egypt, they would ask uh, wise men to come and perform speeches or uh, sing songs about uh, great deeds and, and the great structure of, of uh, harmony in in the world, or the great deeds of, of, of former pharaohs. But this wise man who was asked to, to perform this, those speeches and to attain an enlightened pharaoh, but instead as something completely new, and this is the first time, as far as I know, that, that um, a prophet wants to talk about the future in historical times. So yes, he's, uh, he gets the permission. Yes, you can talk about the future. And he, uh, just, uh, wait a minute. So, <clears throat> so he talks about the future and warns the Pharaoh of the fall of the kingdom or the fourth uh, dynasty and rise of Isfet, which means a lie, injustice or chaos. And a new future Pharaoh will then rise. The prophet prophetically proclaims to re-establish the Ma'at, the truth, justice, order in Egypt and the kingdom of Egypt. So what we see here is, is a different uh, formation of, of moral communication. The epic here centers around the restoration of social order. So the good communication, or, or the, the goodness is order instead of disorder. On the other hand, we had justice with, with the Gilgamesh uh, epic. And this is, seen from our uh, place in, in, in time and space, this is equally uh, old. It's from the 26th century before Christ. You can also look at the Judeo christian version. And uh, we, most of us probably know the history of the tree of knowledge. We have the fall of, of Adam and Eve. It centers around the disobedience of Adam and Eve uh, when they break the one rule set by their God, don't eat the apples from the tree of wisdom. And Puma was alluding to, to this very uh, story in, in the former uh, quotation. So the epic here centers around obedience. Obey your Lord. It's a command. Obey your Lord. A good practice, a good way of, of living 
in the uh, in paradise would be be obedient and the fall of man then is you were disobedient this is morally bad this is evil and in from from the fourth uh, century on the, the snake which is in, in in the text is only a snake was then linked with the devil so the, the rise of the devil from the fourth century on was then linked back into this snake thing which originally might just have been a snake in the story in, in the pre-babylonian version a uh, pre-exile version in the um the yeah actually it's a female uh, that the, the the female in existence the female distinction that breaks the the unity um then we have the iliad the fourth and uh, then we have a trojan prince rubs the wife of the king Agamemnon and Agamemnon summons his allies they besiege Troy and with an ill-conceived plan and got the intervention they create the Trojan horse take the city and set the sails for home so the epic here centers especially in the tragic reframing by Euripides and Sophocles a look at the Ajax uh, tragedy uh, on moral obligation to push against destiny and yet accept fate so again we have a different version of how uh, what is, is morally good and what is evil you know, or what is bad how it, it connects to, to the worldview it's a bit later so this is the the area and, and to sum up we have the gilgamesh which is focused on just and unjust actions we have nefertiti uh, which is the question of order or disorder and we have the genesis uh, story about obedience and disobedience and we have the Ilias story about fate and glory. So we can also then look at something that which is more present and in, into the, the topic that I prefer to talk about, and that is diabolical communication, or in short, diabolics. Here we see an illustration from uh, Freya from, from uh, the 19th century. Lucifer is falling. Lucifer was a light bearer, according to the book of Isaiah, and he had to fall. He was thrown out of heaven. And Isaiah says, uh, Isaiah asks, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? The question of why, why did you fall? And the, the theological uh, argument, at least since uh, uh, 1072, would be because we needed the angel to fall. We needed an angel to fall to mark the cosmological distinction between good and evil, which could not only be in the world human disobedience in regard to one God. We had to make this good and evil uh, all encompassing to make a, a great uh, story that cannot be surpassed. And that uh, leads to a question of, or a struggle for the theologians, what can we actually do with the devil? Throughout the first century, we had, uh, the first millennia, we had a, a very hard uh, discussion about manichaeism. So is God and the devil or the evil, are they two, oppo two opposing forces in, in the world or in, in the universe? And are humans being torn apart between the, the left and right, the good and the evil side? Where's the world placed? Is a, is a man a good thing from the beginning or is, is, is he bad and evil and is, is then drawn to the good side by, by means of, of uh, being good Christians or being, doing good deeds or a baptism or whatever? So this is a, a very serious struggle. But after, uh, after the 10th century, we have a, a strong movement toward that the devil gets stronger and stronger, but on the other hand, he's subordinated into existence. So God must in some way have created, uh, this, um, created the devil. In, and there are many, many different answers uh, how this got about. But then we have Schelling, and that is a radical, radical revolutionary conception of 
uh, the creation and the relation between God and the devil. So if you look at, uh, if you read Schelling, um, he will say, okay, God, he's, to, to make it very short, he's a distinction between ge- uh, creation and generation. But the devil is not something which is uh, a separate powerful force, but he is not created or generated from the, the, the main distinction of creation and generation, but he operates a different form. He operates in principle, he has a different code. It is a code of negation and affirmation. So the devil will always walk through life and through existence and negate. No God. We know from Spencer Brown or from Newman it would be the negation. It's the initial impulse that creates communication. Theory of Society, Volume 1, Chapter 1. So we, we have this idea of, of negation. Devil actually is a, the Kickstarter. It, he says no. And suddenly when there's a no, a negation, we can start to discuss what are the values attached to this negation. And as you can see, it's 1841, 1842, so quite recent. What do we do with God? Well, God is dead. They need to proclaim very famously. or Let Zarathustra uh, claim very famously. And not as famously, but still, it's, it's a good uh, bon mot. Uh, it is told that in Prague in 1963, someone uh, read this on, on a wall. Well, God is dead, Nietzsche proclaims. Nietzsche is dead, God declared. So who is who? What is good? What is bad? So for the last couple of of minutes, let's look at COVID-19 as a moral crisis. What do we actually do with morality? And if we uh, proclaim this is a moral crisis between something is good and something is bad, if social media are, is accelerating a moral crisis or uh, destabilizing a moral structure of, of society or whatever, we need to ask, what is a crisis and the morality connected? As I showed you before, there were I gave you four examples of uh, how something that is good and evil or good and bad can be connected to the Gilgamesh epo- epic and so on. If you go online, search for COVID-19 and moral crisis, and you will find 78 million and something uh, hits on on Google. I did that a couple of days ago. So COVID-19 presents a moral crisis, not just a medical one. It's an interesting uh, quote, as it, in our view, would refers to it's not just a medical crisis inside the functional system of the medical or, or the health system, but it's a moral crisis transcends the medical. It is something, it is, and it is more than a medical uh, crisis. So the text then says, the current pandemic poses basic questions about what it means to be human and live a flourishing life. It puts out our institutions and settled ways of doing things in crisis, provoking the need to reflect on what we are doing and why we are doing it. Crisis forces us to ask whether what we take to be moral is really good or true. At the point of crisis, our assumed ways of doing things no longer fit the world we live in. Our moral commitments are no longer tacit, rules habitually acted upon. And at a point of crisis, we must try to discern and discover whether what we take to be moral can help us respond to this new situation, or does it need recalibrating or even rejecting? So we actually, in this very short quote, and it's a popular th- um, mass media uh, outlet, um, it, it touches upon all four types of uh, how we uh, in, in historical times have constructed uh, the moral distinction. Here's another one. It's from July this year. COVID-19 is more than a public health challenge. We heard that before. It's not only a moral crisis, suddenly it's a moral test. In my view, that links far more to the, the issue of obedient. Are we obedient or reflective enough in regard to the, the moral issues that we have in, or how morality is used in the uh, COVID uh, crisis? And it goes on. 
with another one, and it's the last one uh, from, from mass media, the moral crisis of the pandemic. Oh, the challenge now is to prevent our resources from being overextended or even exhausted by the time the disease ravages the global have-nots. Fortunately, we also have learned what works and what doesn't, and we'll be stress tested. This is really first order engineering logics. This is why we have to start preparing now, even as pundits and political leaders are eager to herald a return to normal. There will be no normal if we forsake the idea of humanity and turn our backs on strangers near and far. So more, uh, the moral crisis suddenly is used as a, a moral uh, pointing finger. We need to do something. Morality uh, sets a demand. We can use moral communication, or at least here, moral communication or the, the, the reference to uh, uh, the moral crisis is we are not human enough. We are using too many resources. Don't listen to the politicians. It's a moral issue. Again, transcending a political and health system. Looking into science, um, I'll give you two examples. Moral decision-making during COVID-19, the moral judgments, moralization, and everyday behavior. And look at the abstract. It's quite interesting. So the, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose significant health, economic, and social challenges, blah, 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 blah. And if you continue further down, uh, it says, while proto-utilitarian tendencies and utilitarian moral judgments remain unchanged during the pandemic, individuals have moralized non-compliant behaviors associated with the pandemic, such as failing to physically distance from others. Importantly, our findings show that this moralization predicts individual compliance with government recommended behaviors and as such provides significant implications for public messaging strategies during the pandemic. Oh, so we are suddenly, depending on how our moral stand uh, is, we are more or less uh, analytically identifiable uh, by our communicative performance, what we think is good and bad, maybe what we post on social media or in, in uh, mass media or in, in uh, science journals, we are predictable on how we will assess morally the public messaging strategies and if our bodies will comply with the, the uh, instructions defined. So it's suddenly a moral issue and not just a political issue of obedience. And the last one here, distances and non-distances. The potential social psychological impact of moralizing COVID-19 mitigation practices on sustained behavior change. This one continues in the same language. If you look at the last paragraph of the abstract, in this paper, we explore how and why these processes might come to pass the impact on overall societal response to COVID-19 and the need to factor such processes into decisions regarding and how to lift restrictions. Sorry, I forgot a sentence. It's about the mitigation practices and the moral imperatives we have to. The uh, public communications is very, is thriving with, with morality about what you should do and what you shouldn't. So adhering to the COVID-19 mitigation practices is presently high among the general public and the stringent lockdown measures are supported by legal and policy interventions and so on. So we have a question of uh, temporalization of morality, of moral judgments. What is good? What is, it? what is not good? And remembering the four types I gave in the introduction, Gilgamesh, the just and unjust actions of rule, nefertiti, order, disorder, Genesis, obedience, disobedience, disobedience being bad, obedience being good. And the Indias, the question of, of fate and glory, and which has a far a higher level of reflexity. So a couple of months ago, uh, Stefan and uh, a good friend of mine who is a, as an, a mathematical epidemiologist uh, and and me, we published a paper. Oh, we looked into what was the factual uh, perspective. What what uh, what truth was out there to speak in, in Romanian context? Was the truth showing that the the COVID nineteen uh, uh, illness pandemic would not be very serious or would not harm a large population? 
you know, large numbers of, of, uh, of people? Or is there any, is there no evidence of, of uh, that being the case? Would it be unilaterally, uh, unidirection uh, directed toward what the WHO said at that time? We have 3.4, 3.5, or as the Spanish said, 10% of a, a case fatality rate, 10% will die of the, uh, of, of the pandemic. We showed uh, in, in, in the article that there was indeed uh, some truth uh, existent or some evidence in, 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 research, in, in the medical research existent that this would not be the case. It would be a mild version of or similar to an influenza. And um, the politicians uh, chose another uh, version. They chose a version that this is dangerous. We are all going to die and we need uh, harsh lockdowns. That's what politicians do. They make decisions that are collectively binding. After a couple of months, we had uh, a reopening um, and uh, quite uh, fast. Other countries were, were slower. And now we have a, some call it a second wave or a, a re-emergence of, of uh, uh, raising infection numbers. And the discussion goes, should we impose new lockdowns? like they have done in Israel uh, since yesterday. Yeah, what do politicians say? They say, had we known then what we know now, then we would have done this or that. And this links perfectly to the Jesper's discussion about, well, the science uh, has multiple uh, equally competing truths uh, available and politicians log into different uh, versions of it uh, and experts log in and they reduce complexity and they make decisions and create a binding decision on what is right and what is true. So we actually it, it could look at Kozelek's futures past. There was a future in March, April, where uh, the governments could have reacted otherwise. And we should not be too harsh on them because they chose what they chose. And they are, for, for the most part, elected. We are in uh, Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik uh, has uh, re-emerged on red lists and uh, on, on different, different uh, statistics that this is a dangerous place to be. I want to show you this picture. It's taken two days ago. Here, the infection numbers are a bit higher than, than in central Copenhagen at the moment. Let's see, there is nobody. And the one thing is statistics, and the other thing is if there are no people, if there are no bodies, we can't really get infected. Look here, usually it's completely crowded, but it, it, it is uh, at least there will be there are way fewer people than when I go to the mall uh, back in Denmark or any shop. Look here, you can go out and see the sea, empty chairs. This is also an effect of the pandemic and of more communication empty chairs. And this signals are, in my view, is, is an important reminder, all the empty chairs, that's a communication or a symbol of the chairs that are not there anymore, the people that are not there, the bodies that are, have left for, for a period of time. So let's go back to the moral cross. Dynamics of morals, well, the devil being evil and um, I have an accounting book on the right side. It's, it's a story of you need to account for all your deeds, either in numbers or in letters. But this would be a cross. So good and bad can make a re-entry and not only make a re-entry into the good side, so there are good goods and good bands, but they can also make entries into the negative side so we can have bad goods and bad bads. It's very simple. <laughs> But what does it do to moral communication? And how does it inform our research and analysis of what's going on in the political communication in regard to the pandemic? The above one, two sections, the good goods and the good bands, they generate temporal stability. It is good, that's the affirmative, the positive version. It is good that you did the good things you, you wore a mask, you did the lockdown. That was a good thing that you did the good thing. 
or you could even have good bats. So it was a bad deed uh, that we locked down the society uh, or, or had temporary lockdowns. And we know that it has repercussions in the economy and it has uh, repercussions into personal lives and livelihoods and, and even mental health issues and, and, and other health issues. But it was a good thing to do. It was the right thing to do. It gives a temporary stability. We have, we continue to, to, to value the things we did as something that was morally good. But I showed you the one quote that, that says, well, if we had known what we now know back in March or in February or in April, then what we then argued was being a good thing to do suddenly might be a bad thing to do. It was a bad, good thing to do. And even there were bad, bad things going on. And they lead to a, a temporal reflexivity, not anymore attached to a global cosmological or theistic vision of, of uh, Olympian gods doing this and that. But you are, we are, and this is a very concrete example with the pandemic. We have an acceleration or a, 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 we have pulled the, the, the links uh, for moral communication down from the heaven. They are stuck in society. And what's going on in society has dynamic valuations of individual actions or communications. And the, thereby, with this cross, with this, <laughs> some would say Christian cross, uh, you can uh, actually mark a, st a stability, a temporal stability, or a temporal reflexivity in moral communication. And if you are into the Spencer Brown, it would, uh, in, in the well, sorry to say, true version and not the Dick Becker version, uh, probably look like this, the moral, uh, the, with a double re-entry. So I don't think COVID-19 is a moral crisis. It isn't. It's a moral temporal reflexivity on steroids. It's really accelerating what is good and what is bad. It's going very fast. So we don't have a social deceleration maybe in small islands of, 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 of a society, you have to stay at home, uh, things go slower. No, but things act faster. Look at the news cycles, pushing news, 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 everything is going faster. And what was good yesterday is bad today. And we have this re uh, massive level of re uh, reflexivity, fighting which version is better than, than uh, the other uh, version. So, it poses challenges for structural couplings, for semantic infusions of health metaphors, society sick, uh, decision uh, pr process making is, is uh, sick, or is we have to immunize uh, certain areas of our economy to provide for uh, future uh, income for the state and so on. But suddenly organizations and functional systems have to cope with a huge influx of, of health related uh, semantics. So going back, what does it all have to do with the devil? It's an agreement. This is a, a well-known illustration from Faust. To the right, you have Mephistoteles, who has arrived. But it is Faust, so Dr. Faustus, who at one point says, I stand here uh, <clears throat> before you, and I am as, as smart as I was before. I've studied theology, medicine, I studied whatever I could do in engineering, but I didn't get any smarter. So let's make a deal with the devil. And he makes the deal, it's printed with blood. And if we stick to Luhmann, will it quote will, what he says? Morality is the devil's doing. Then what we have done in this pandemic crisis is to stick a deal with the devil to use morality as some sort of trigger function and uh, temporary reflexivity. And I think that is dangerous. But suddenly we can describe it with, with the Luhmann and the Faustian re uh, reference. So that was it. That's the moral cross that we see right here.